Hi, and welcome to my podcast, Jack to the Future. From science and inventions to pollution and recycling, I talk about what's changing in the world, the future, and how we can help with that. Every month I'll talk about a different future theme. For example, the future of science, tech, sustainability, reading, music and all sorts of other ones. The future of everything. Did you know? You can find me on Facebook and Instagram as Jade to the Future and on YouTube as Jack to the Future. Follow me to get behind the scenes info, access to the previews about my next episodes and much, much more. This week's episode is about the future of road vehicles. I called it that because we're not just talking about cars, anything that drives on the road. I talked with Joe Hacker, an electrical controls and instrumentation engineer who worked for a company in the green power sector, specifically hydrogen storage, distribution and dispensing. We talk about the company Joe works for, NanoSun, and their hydrogen refuelling stations. We discuss the future of road vehicles, other transport and everyday life in the future as well. So cars of the future, hmm, what do you think? You may have seen on social media that mum put a photo of a more modern, futuristic version of the DeLorean by Spanish car designer. Unfortunately, it is only an image, but I'm still hoping it might become a reality at some point in the future. The sci-fi dream of a future car would probably be one that flies or drives itself, and I know some have been tested, but actually, is that all really necessary? Surely our priority should actually be thinking about the environment and the impact that vehicle emissions have on global warming. The European Commission website says that cars and vans are responsible for around 12% and 2.5% of total emissions of carbon dioxide, CO2, in Europe, which is the main greenhouse gas. From 2035, all new vehicles will have to be zero emission. That means a vehicle that does not let out gas or other pollution from the exhaust pipe. They're basically stopping making petrol and diesel cars, so we need to look at alternatives. You may have listened to my episode on the future of electricity. We mentioned vehicles briefly there, but today we're going to talk specifically about using electricity to power vehicles. We all know about electric cars powered with a battery. I'm seeing more and more when you drive about. There's a lot of advantages to them, but depending where you live, there's not that many fast charging points around, which can mean your journeys are limited or you have to wait a long time for it to recharge. So it may still not be so green. To make lithium ion batteries for electric cars, it actually creates carbon dioxide from making lithium, which again, from my future of electricity episode, you'll know is making global warming worse. So what about hydrogen? I'm going to start with the basics. You know how much I love chemistry. So, hydrogen is the element that is most of in the universe. It's found in the sun, other stars and some planets in our solar system. On its own, hydrogen is a gas that has no colour, smell or taste. However, pure hydrogen is also almost missing from our own atmosphere here on Earth, but luckily, because it is part of so many things and mixes well with other elements, particularly carbon, we can separate it out. My special guest will talk about how we get the hydrogen later on. So, what do we use for hydrogen at the moment? Listen to these sounds and see if they give you any clues. Any guesses? In order they were... In water, it is part of the water on Earth, two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen. Hydrogen used in rocket fuel, when combined with liquid oxygen, BOOM! Changing liquid vegetable oil to solid fats, like margarine for cooking, this process is called hydrogenation. For making ammonia, the main use of hydrogen on Earth is to make ammonia. It's used in things like fertiliser for plants, cleaning products, making plastic, and fabrics, all sorts. And finally, yep, you've guessed it, what about hydrogen filled cars? Heard of that before? No, neither had I. But we should, because it's the cleanest fuel alternative possible. When the atoms in hydrogen join together, they release loads of energy which can be used to drive a vehicle. Basically, hydrogen is compressed or squeezed into fuel tanks and then mixes with oxygen to create electricity to power the car. Hydrogen fueled vehicles give off very little carbon dioxide, just water and heat out of the exhaust pipe. Hydrogen cars are refilled like petrol or diesel car. It takes around 5 minutes to fill the tank and they can hold around 5 times more energy than a battery. Wow! 
So today's episode is all about hydrogen fueled road vehicles. So trucks, cars, things like that. Although later on we do move on to talk about boats too. Joe works for Nanosun. They specialise in making and supplying hydrogen refuelling stations that can go anywhere. The refuelling station, a pioneer they call it, looks like a massive box and it can go on the back of a lorry or trailer and be taken wherever it's needed to refuel. Cars, buses, trucks, vans, you name it. Mum will put a link in the podcast description to a video that tells you all about it. I'd like to welcome my special guest today, Joe Hacker, who is the Principal Electrical Controls and Instrumentation Engineer for a company called Nanosun, who design and build mobile hydrogen refueling stations. Lots of long words there. I look forward to understanding a bit more about them. Thanks for joining me today, Joe. And lovely to join you, Jack, and lovely to be here. Thank you. I'm not sure I understand what your job title actually is or what you do exactly. Could you tell me a bit more, please? So I'm an electrical engineer. My job title is ECNI engineer, which stands for electrical controls and instrumentation, but it all sort of means the same thing, doing electrics and wiring and sort of computer programming, that kind of stuff. Everything that you build in industry needs something to control it. A lot of things these days are all controlled by computers. So what we do is we take those computers, we write the programs to make them do what they need to do, and then we connect it to all of the equipment. So things like in oil and gas, it's things like pipelines with pressure sensors and gauges and all this sort of thing. But also say the same job applies to big factories that are producing cars and you've got to monitor robot arms and things like that. I think it's really cool because you can be working in a place where there's almost no one there and the whole thing is like producing cars automatically or in warehouses where they've got robots that go around automatically and pick all of the orders for you and no one touches it. It's all just done by sort of magic. Yeah, I think it was for my Future of Work episode. I saw a robot walking in a warehouse for Ricardo. It's where it picked everyone's food out. But it was really yeah. fine. It was like, yeah, I guess that's sort of a generic overview of what we do. Hopefully, maybe that helps. Yeah, it does. It helps. Your company uses hydrogen as an alternative fuel source, doesn't it? Why is that? We work in a hydrogen industry. We're pushing towards green hydrogen as a future. So it's about working towards net zero and being carbon neutral, all that sort of thing, and working towards trying to help the planet if we can. And as an engineer, that's really rewarding because you're making stuff, making new things for hopefully what will be future generations like yourself to improve the way we're living and what technology we're using to help save the planet. In my opinion, is a really important and critical thing. Like it's, we need to be doing it now, not tomorrow. Yeah, it is. Why is it called Nanosun? Is it because it somehow uses the sun to make hydrogen? <laughs> How does it do that? It's not very sunny here. Is that a problem? <laughs> it's an interesting question, that one. Lots of people ask where the company name comes from. It was made up by one of our founders, but the story I always tell is called Nanosun because three quarters of the sun is hydrogen, and the sun uses that hydrogen to produce energy, which we on Earth receive as heat and light. Because we want to help people use hydrogen, this is our company, as a source of energy, you could sort of argue that we're like a small sun. So nano being another word for small, Hence, you've got nano sun. So small sun, we use hydrogen as an energy source for people. And we're obviously nothing like the scale of the sun. So that's one of the reasons why. Uh, to answer your question about using the sun to make hydrogen or sun's energy to make hydrogen, that's quite an interesting one because it's not something that we do as a company, but it is something that lots of people are looking into. And the way you can do that is you can use electrical energy to produce hydrogen in what's called an electrolyzer. So actually, people are using solar panels to get energy from the sun to produce hydrogen. And that might be perhaps not a great idea here in the UK, but uh, in other places in the world, like in the US, in America, they have a lot more solar energy than we do here. And in places in the Middle East, where the power of the sun is much more powerful than here, they can use that energy to produce hydrogen. And obviously, because it's renewable energy, it's sort of releasing carbon and greenhouse gases. And so it's what they call green hydrogen because it's eco-friendly. So although the name Nanosun has got very little to do with producing hydrogen from sun, it is something that a lot of other companies are doing as well. Oh, yeah. I like how it originated of where they got it from. Exactly. So what does Nanosun do? As a company, we manufacture hydrogen refueling stations. So we just store and move the gas around and then dispense it into vehicles which we'll come on to so where do you actually get the hydrogen from then yeah it's a good question where do we get the hydrogen from well lots of different places actually so 
But in terms of where we get the hydrogen from, uh, loads of different places, we try to focus on getting green hydrogen, as I mentioned, because that's the most carbon neutral, the most environmentally friendly way of doing it. And there are a number of companies in the UK that are doing that and in Europe. One of the people we're working with, they're a spin-off from Octopus Energy, the energy provider called Octopus Hydrogen. So it's the same parent company, but they're looking at using green sources of energy to produce the hydrogen, at which point they'll be then using our systems to store that and take it to their customers who might be vehicle manufacturers or people running buses or trucks or cars or whatever. So lots of different places. You can get hydrogen that isn't green, isn't environmentally friendly, but we try to steer away from that if we can. One of the main problems is there's not enough hydrogen being produced yet in the world. And so we're really keen for more other companies to get on board with producing hydrogen that is green. So sorry, a bit of a long answer to that question, but it's slightly more complicated. (laughs) Perfect answer. Is hydrogen expensive? And also, let's say if it was carrying it along in a truck, if the truck crashed, it could potentially explode or set on fire. So So there's an interesting story I have about that, about how hydrogen in vehicles actually is potentially safer than petrol. Oh, really? So hydrogen is safe? Can I hear about it, please? Okay, so there are a lot of questions about hydrogen safety. Lots of people talk about the Hindenburg, which is a a big disaster that happened with a hydrogen-filled balloon a number of years ago. Obviously, technology has moved on a lot since then, and we're using hydrogen in a different way. But some of the car manufacturers that are making hydrogen vehicles have done a lot of tests to understand the safety of tanks in cars. Because you're right in that a car could be driving down the motorway at 70 miles an hour, and if it crashes, the last thing we want is an explosion. And the tanks that we use for storing hydrogen in cars are actually very tough. The way to think about it is if you have a Coke can that's full of Coke, so you've unopened it, if you try and stand on that Coke can, try and crush it by like jumping on it, you'll find it very difficult because the pressure inside the can keeps the can solid. As soon as you empty out all of that Coke, you can stand on it and you can crush it. A lot of people do that when they recycle their cans. And so the way to think about a hydrogen tank is you almost always have some gas inside, but actually it's a very tough container, not only because it's designed to be tough, but also because it has that pressure inside. And actually, I believe it was Hyundai did some tests to try and see what it would take to break this hydrogen tank. And in the end, they had to shoot it with a powerful rifle to get it to explode. They crashed the car, they lit a bonfire underneath it, all this kind of thing. And in some cases, there was some damage and there was leaks, but actually to cause the worst case, they had to shoot the thing with a very powerful rifle to get it to explode. So in normal circumstances where a petrol car might crash, the petrol might spill, the petrol might catch a light and cause a fire. In most circumstances, the evidence so far has suggested that the hydrogen tank would be safer than a petrol car. Yeah, that's quite a dangerous story, but yeah. Yeah. But obviously not many people are shooting petrol yeah. tanks with rifles. So most of the time, <laughs> shouldn't be a problem. It's not like a hydrogen car would be in front of another car and the car has a, a really powerful rifle and decides to shoot the back of it to explode the <laughs> Yeah, that, that's unlikely enough that we shouldn't yeah. need to worry about it. <laughs> and I guess the other thing to bear in mind is there aren't many hydrogen cars around. So One thing we won't find out is until we get lots of cars on the road, it's very hard to understand the full impact of these sorts of things. How do hydrogen cells work? There's two different types. There's a hydrogen fuel cell, which is what you put into cars to power or vehicles to power them. And there's also electrolyzers, which is what you use to produce the hydrogen. So they both work in very similar ways, but I'll talk about the hydrogen fuel cell because it's perhaps slightly easier to understand. But in all cases, we use very few things to make them work. We use hydrogen, oxygen, water, and electricity. So in a fuel cell, what we do is we take the hydrogen that we've already got stored on board, this is in the vehicle. We take oxygen from the air, so we can just use the natural air around and take the oxygen out of the air. And we combine those to produce the electricity and all that comes out the end in terms of a byproduct is water, H2O, two lots of hydrogen and one lots of oxygen. And how they work is that you basically pass the hydrogen and oxygen into the fuel cell. And inside, there is what's called a proton exchange membrane. It's a very complex piece of chemical technology. But basically what it is, is a very, very fine, fine mesh with tiny, tiny holes. 
So we're talking about the size of an atom. So it's very, very small. Yeah. And first off, the hydrogen comes in, it gets split into what's called a positively charged hydrogen proton and an electron. So it's positive and negative charges. The positive charge can pass through the hole. So it's small enough to pass through. But the negative charge, which is what causes the electrical current to flow, can't pass through the holes. And therefore, it must go via the wires that are connected to the electrolyzer. And that's what causes an electrical current to flow. On the other side, once it goes back to the other side of the mesh, it then combines with the hydrogen, the oxygen, and turns into water. And that's how you get water at the end. It's quite a complicated process, but basically we use this barrier to, from the hydrogen, we get this electrical current flow, these negatively charged particles flowing through our copper wires, which can then charge our batteries, power our motors, drive our cars, all that sort of thing. So I guess the simple answer is through some very complicated chemistry, that's how a hydrogen fuel cell works. Wow, uh, that, was, that was quite a lot of information there. I appreciate it. it's quite complicated. Yeah. I try to see if I could break it down into simple terms, but it's one of these things that's quite a complicated process. If there are quite a number of videos that show it, and it's much easier to understand, it might be a good thing to have a look at. I watched a video and it had a copper wire and a motor, and it showed lifting up the cathode, anode yeah. and the cathode, yes. And then it like puts them together, and the oxygen and the hydrogen. I don't know if that's the same thing you're talking about, though. It sounds very similar. Funny thing is electrolyzers that produce hydrogen work the very similar way. So rather than electricity coming out, you put an electrical current through the electrolyzer and rather than it combining it into water from hydrogen and oxygen, what it does is it takes water and splits it back out into hydrogen and oxygen. And it's basically a reverse process. The same thing, you have an anode and a cathode in both of them, but you just sort of do it in reverse. Again, there's some slightly more complicated chemistry involved that, to be honest, goes above my head. But that's basically the same thing. And I guess the important thing to remember is the production of hydrogen is by an electrolyzer, which takes electricity and water and produces hydrogen and oxygen. And the fuel cell is what you use to make power from hydrogen. And that takes hydrogen and oxygen and produces electricity and water. So that's the two things sort of fundamental to remember. Yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Um, the Pioneer refueling stations in the video aren't very big. How many vehicles could be charged at once? So with our refueling station, you can only refuel one vehicle at a time. However, the Pioneer refueling station is designed to be small because it's designed to be mobile. It's supposed to be able to be put onto the back of a truck and then transported to different locations. So if it was too big, it would be very difficult to transport on the roads or, or very easily. So although we can only refuel one vehicle at a time, that is sort of intended as part of the design. It makes it very easy for our customers and people using it to take it to wherever they need it to be, whether that's filling it back up with hydrogen or taking it to some remote location where they need the hydrogen gas for buses and trucks, cars, etc. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I understand why it's very big because if you had like a hydrogen container or anything, you might think it'd be a lot to store in. So you might think it'd be like as big as a house. So, but that wouldn't be easy to travel around. To answer your question there, one of the things we do to store more hydrogen is we store it at a very high pressure. So, if you think about the tires on a car, they're filled with air, they're pressurized to about two or three bar. And bar is a term we use for indicating pressure. Now, this pressure in our system, we store the gas at 450 bar. So we're talking about significantly more pressure than what's in your tire of your car. But that means we can basically cram lots of hydrogen in to a very small space, which is what we try and do. And then the other thing worth knowing is, although we can only refuel one vehicle at once, you can use that hydrogen on, it's something between 10 and 15 buses and trucks before you run out. So you can do sort of multiple vehicles, but then once it's empty, you have to take it back and fill it back up again and repressurize the system back up to its full pressure. Cool, yeah. That's quite a lot of pressure. I mean, it is a gas, so it's quite small. So you might be able to fit it in yeah. bigger. Yeah. How many more vehicles would a petrol station be able to fill up? So, well, I guess the difference is a petrol station that's sort of static is designed for kind of mass usage. 
our system is intended for using for people that are kind of starting out to use hydrogen vehicles where building a big petrol station is too cost prohibitive or where you want something kind of as a backup for your petrol station for like a bigger fixed station and so a normal petrol station for a car you could fill up hundreds of cars from that i imagine whereas in our case a car has a smaller tank so in our case you could fill up probably i think it's something between 20 to 30 car tanks rather than bus tanks because their tanks are bigger but still it's significantly lower but i guess there are people building fixed stations that are like a petrol station that can do a lot more but we try and make it it's one of our sort of specialities is that our system can be moved to wherever you need it can be used in a temporary way but one of the limitations is you can only fill up so many cars or boxes or trucks okay cool <laughs> is there actual hydrogen cells in those pioneer containers or are they kept in a factory or power station so the hydrogen fuel cells are in the vehicles that we refuel so they're not inside the pioneer system ah okay i thought that the fuel cells themselves were on your pioneer unit thingy and you swapped empty ones for full ones in the vehicles so the factory where those cells are made, does hydrogen power the whole factory? Actually, there are people using hydrogen fuel cells for powering things like factories and homes, etc. because all they do is they produce electricity. So you can use that electricity for whatever you'd like. Obviously, normally, people power, have take electricity from the power network. So it's you just connect up a cable and it's it's easy. But say you were in a very remote location, you might need to have a, a means of generating electricity that didn't use the national power network. For example, at the moment, you would normally be using a diesel generator. But obviously, again, that emits carbon and greenhouse gases. And so using a fuel cell, a hydrogen fuel cell with hydrogen that is produced from a renewable energy source, you can get that same electricity that's carbon neutral and much better for the environment. Okay, sure. Would well, you need this special charging hole in the side of your vehicle for hydrogen fuel? Yes, yes, you do. There's a special connector, which all hydrogen vehicles have. And actually, it's quite important because it means that you can't connect too much pressure to a hydrogen vehicle. You can only connect the pressure that it's designed for. Normally, they put those connectors where you'd expect to have a, a petrol refueling port. So you fill up the car in the same way you fill up a petrol engine. You pull up to the fueling station, you open up the refueling petrol cover, and then there's a little connector and you plug it in press go on the refueling station and it works. And once it's done, it tells you it's done and you disconnect it and close the door again and drive off. Because cool. <laughs> in the video uh, that we watched, were they like unique vehicles to the video? Because there isn't any like cars on driving on the road right now, which are actually hydrogen. So there are some cars driving on the road that are hydrogen powered. However, there are very, very few of them. So the company I mentioned, Hyundai, they have a car called the Mirai, which is a hydrogen car. I think at the moment, though, they only sell them to people that know how to get hydrogen. So they're not selling them to the normal public, which is probably why you've never seen one before. But I think in the next sort of few years, they'll start to sell those to the general public. And so hopefully we'll see more and more of them. One of the problems that we have is that refueling cars from hydrogen is difficult because there aren't many refueling stations across the UK that will give you hydrogen. So one of the things they're waiting for in terms of selling to the public, so for, for you and me, is to have more refueling stations so that people can drive around and pull up to any petrol station and fill up with hydrogen as well. And yeah, the Toyota sells one, Hyundai sells one, and BMW are making one at the moment as well. But I think in the next probably five years to 10 years, you'll start to see a lot more hydrogen cars around. Okay, cool. Um, I'm excited to see no more bad fumes <laughs> coming out of smelling. And I may even, when I'm older, get to drive for myself, which would probably be quite likely. That sounds cool. I'd hope so. I would like to drive one. I haven't had the chance yet, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, so first of all, there might just have been an extra pump at the petrol station for hydrogen. So there's a choice. And then eventually it will all be like that in the future. Yeah, there'll definitely be a mix. I think if you ask people, especially in the hydrogen industry, we all understand that 
they won't just be hydrogen. There'll be battery vehicles, so normal like char- the ones you have to charge up, and then there'll be hydrogen vehicles, and then maybe there'll be something we haven't even thought of yet. So there'll be a mix of things depending on what's good for you, depending on how you live and what makes sense. And for businesses, it depends on how they use their vehicles as well. So, cool. Would you need somebody to fill up your car or could you do it yourself? So there are refueling stations that you can fill up yourself. So there's a few around in the UK at the moment. Our refueling station, the Pioneer system, at the moment, you would need someone to help you. So you need someone who's got some training to help you. But that's just because our system is intended not for the public. It's intended generally for people running bus fleets, so sort of county councils or bus companies, or for people running fleets of trucks, so people that are doing long distance transport of goods, that sort of thing. So they would have people trained using the system. We are hoping to work towards the system where anyone can turn up and plug in their car and press go, but... Cool. That's very interesting of the other stations doing it because more things are getting better from the environment, I'd say. Yeah. And we're really keen that the general public can use it because the last thing you want is to have to have loads of people helping you or whatever. It, it's not, it doesn't make sense for the long term. Yeah. It is something we're really keen to do. And, and also really keen for people to understand that, that it is safe because lots of people, I've spoken to people myself where they're worried about the safety, like we talked about earlier. And I think one of the things is because there are concerns, actually us as engineers are working really hard to make it as safe as possible. So actually there's some argument that we're making hydrogen refueling stations safer than petrol stations because lots of people are very worried. So we're putting a lot of energy and time into making it safe. Yeah, okay. We saw loads of buttons on the Pioneer and I saw someone fueling up somebody's van in the video. So that's why I wondered about that last question. That someone was me. The person in that video doing a lot of the work is me. Oh, was it? There's a few shots of like someone turning it on and connecting things, and that's me. And then um, there's also shots of someone connecting a van up with a refueling hose, and that's also me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on the part of the video, there's like somebody goes across and they like tap the side of the thing. That would be me as well. <laughs> the videographer that was there was like, that would look good. So, uh, Walking in doing that sort of 10 times over and over is very weird. <laughs> oh, I bet when I did the film for National Trust, I did it not an overreaction, but it took like five or six hours to do it. And so, yeah, I get what you're eating by it is a bit hard. I've not done anything else filming or anything like that before then, but uh, yeah, it was funny having to repeat everything multiple times. <laughs> there was supposed to be a giant hydrogen fuel cell factory built in Norway this year by the company Teco 2030. Have you heard about it? They want to make a gigafactory, 1.2 gigawatts a year. Uh, That reminds me of 1.21 gigawatts from Back to the Future. Um, Is that a lot? So, yeah, well, I hadn't heard of it before you told me, actually, but I had done some research. And basically, I had a look, and it looks like a really exciting project. So 1.2 gigawatts a year is a lot, but it's probably not as much as we need. So to give you an idea... The average power of a car is 200 kilowatts, which is about five and a half thousand times less. But that means that those guys are able to make, let's say, a year, five and a half thousand cars. But obviously, if we want to change all of the cars in the world to be hydrogen, we need more than five and a half thousand a year. We need probably 10 to 100 times that. So it is a lot. And it's really, really good to hear what they're doing. But I guess the thing we need to take away is actually we need more people to be doing what they're doing and building these gigafactories to keep up with the petrol industry or to try and overtake that industry to sell to more people. The other thing I found was interesting, I read an article about it. They're looking at doing fuel cells for container ships. So massive ships that send containers across the world need a lot of power, as you can imagine. And so one of the things they're looking at doing is producing, I think it was 10 megawatt fuel cells, which is a lot. They'll be big for powering these ships and it's really impressive to see that someone's doing that because we need to be decarbonizing so changing over to hydrogen or battery we need to be doing that to everything not just cars and trucks and buses that's on the road but also trains planes and ships as well 
And interestingly, we're working with some companies in those areas as well, where we're trying to decarbonize some of those other industries. Oh, uh, it's good that other people are doing it. I think more people should make these to power lots of different sort of vehicles. It's very good that your company is doing it as well. Do you think we could use hydrogen for other things in the future? Yes, is the answer. And people are already trying to do some other things with hydrogen as well. So at the moment, one of the main focuses is hydrogen for vehicles. But some people are also looking at using hydrogen for heating our homes. At the moment, a lot of houses are heated with natural gas. They burn gas to run your boilers that runs your central heating system and heats up your water. That's natural gas, which is comes out of the ground from the, the North Sea. But actually, they're looking at switching to using hydrogen or a combination of hydrogen and natural gas. And obviously, if we use a combination, it should mean we can use less natural gas than we are using, which, which is better for the environment. So that's one thing that people are looking at. At the moment, hydrogen is actually used in industry. For example, it's used in producing tungsten metal, when that will continue to happen. But hopefully we can switch to using hydrogen that's produced in an eco-friendly way. What's tungsten used for? I think I, I already basically know what tungsten is, but I kind of don't in a way. I know it is a metal, but I don't know how to they use it in different alloys. Alloy is a term for, for mixes of metals. Yeah. And they use that for things like cutting edges. So tungsten carbide is a oh. is quite often used uh, for knives and for tools used for cutting other things like in drill bits and this kind of thing. Okay. And then finally, one thing that people are looking at is using hydrogen to produce electricity directly to power your home. So rather than having coal-fired power stations and nuclear power stations, you might have a hydrogen power station. And one of the benefits of that is that with lots of renewable energy like wind and solar, the power that we get changes all the time. So it's very hard to manage what power we're getting from the wind turbines and from solar panels. And so hydrogen can be used to store up um, that energy. When we have lots of extra electricity, we take that and we convert that into hydrogen and we store the hydrogen. And then when we don't have enough electricity, we can then take that hydrogen and turn it back into electricity to make up for the demand. That's clever. It could work both ways. That sounds really cool that they're doing it for loads of things. Is there a hydrogen fueled factory producing hydrogen cells yet? <laughs> I don't think it's happening yet, but it's completely possible that that might be happening in the future, probably 10 years away at this point, hopefully even sooner. Uh, but... It could have lots of different uses then. We need to produce more so that more people can use it. So with a, a big boat like you mentioned, how do they have the space to store hydrogen fuel cells that were that big? So at, at the moment, I guess you'd be replacing their diesel engines or their petrol engines. I'm not, I'm not sure actually what they use with a fuel cell and an electric motor and some batteries because you probably want some a little bit of battery storage. That's usually what they what they need. But the engines, I've never seen one in person, but looking at ship engines, if you have a Google of it, they are like multi-stories. So you can see a picture of someone stood next to them and there's like, they could be stood next to it on one floor and there's like three or four floors below them and like five floors above them. That's the extent of the engine. I might be slightly exaggerating, but it's pretty big. And so you've got all of that space to put in your fuel cell, your motor and your batteries. And usually motors can be a lot smaller for the same power output as a petrol engine or a diesel engine. So already you're saving a bit of space there. So you've got some space for your fuel cell and for your batteries. And I guess we already know from the cars that they've made that within the same space of the engine bay in a car, you can fit a fuel cell and a motor. And then usually the batteries go sort of under the seats. So from the smaller scale, they're about the equivalent size of a petrol diesel engine. I don't actually know quite how it scales to something so big as sort of 10 megawatts uh, for a container ship. But I imagine they'll basically slot it into the same space that they would use for the diesel engine. What would happen to the old engines, I wonder? Environmentally friendly recycle the diesel engine. That's what they should do. <laughs> not, not be like pirates and knock it over with a cannonball or something. No, no, they should responsibly dispose of their waste. <laughs> If they're going to use old ships and replace the engines, they could do the same with cars. I imagine so. I mean, I've seen people do conversions of cars to like fully electric. Mm. Um, I was watching someone on YouTube who's been converting like an old US Army Hummer from like what was a really petrol or diesel intensive engine using lots of petrol to an electric. It's really clever. We also saw this picture of like a, like a rundown like train and they changed it to like a solar train. 
But there are some companies doing hydrogen trains as well. With things like trains and ships, the point is, is because it's such a big thing, it's so much easier from an engineering point of view to start with an existing version of something. So you start with a train body that's the same train body you've always used, the same wheels, the same everything. And then you take out the electrical diesel bit or whatever you're doing, and then you put in your hydrogen fuel cell in the same space because to redesign the entire ship is really difficult. Cars, on the other hand, I guess you use similar bodies, but being a lot smaller and I guess easier to change, it's sort of easier to make something more custom to what you're doing. Whereas I guess something like a ship, you would take an existing design or even an existing ship and you'd change it. So you're less likely to see someone changing a car like by hand sort of from petrol, but then you're more likely to see the bigger things being changed as a sort of retrofit, I suppose is the word we would use. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Hydrogen DeLorean. How cool would that be? <laughs> yeah. Have you seen the Tesla Cybertruck? Oh, yeah, yeah. It was Lots of sharp it, angles and yeah. squares and everything. I think they said it was like one of the fastest. Did you see that video with Elon Musk on the stage? Yeah, it didn't start and then and then he made like a joke out of it. And then... Yeah. <laughs> I still like one anyway. <laughs> Thank you for being here today, Joe. My favourite bit is when we've been talking about, well, all of it, really. Um, All of the complicated words. I especially really like when we talked about the company Echo 2030 and Gigafactories and obviously your company and stuff like that. So, Well, thank you very much for having me on to your podcast. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, Jack, and to answer your questions. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That's unfortunately all we have time for today. It's been really interesting finding out about hydrogen fuel. I didn't know anything about it before. But if we're going to use hydrogen as an alternative fuel in vehicles, it needs to be produced in a greener way, like Joe said. We don't want to use fossil fuels and we want to keep the amount of carbon dioxide low, low, low. I'm not saying that hydrogen cars will replace everything. As we mentioned, I think both electric vehicles and hydrogen ones will be good together. And obviously, again, we need to make the cost cheaper so people can actually afford to buy them and actually have more refueling stations so we can actually fill a tank up. But I think it's exciting for the future. There's other things that I would like to talk about if we had time, like how the materials that tyres are made from will convert heat energy to electricity and how lithium sulphur batteries in electric cars might solve the charging and emission problems at the moment. There's lots of possibilities and engineers are working really hard to find solutions. The question though really is, will we drive the vehicles of the future or will they drive us? Join me next time for another exciting episode of Jack to the Future.